Hey, everybody. Welcome to Dad's Den of Pop Culture. It is Saturday the 14th, so congratulations to everybody for surviving Friday the 13th this year. Seemed like a good day to review a little comedy movie. Mm, Well, at least intentionally a comedy movie from 1981 called Saturday the 14th. This is a movie that comes from the the time when uh, we'd had Airplane, we'd had Mel Brooks movies. These kind of spoof movies were really big and everybody was trying to do them. And oftentimes not as successfully as Mel Brooks or uh, Zucker Abrams and Zucker. And in fact, Mel Brooks didn't even do it as successfully as Mel Brooks did sometimes. They're tough movies to get right. And this might not have been one that got it right. It starts with an animated sequence. You can see the quality of the art is stunning. New World Pictures. A lot of great little cult movies from New World. Uh, You know, horror type stuff. Uh, If you're you're kind of a nerd, there's probably a lot of New World stuff that you like. This may not be one of them. Um, So, if this comedy movie is not that great, why is it not that great? Well, it ain't really because of Richard Benjamin, although he's not great in this film, but he has some comedy chops, directed Money Pit, great flick, um, one early early Tom Hanks movie. Um, and he's a good actor, and he can do drama, he can do comedy. I'm not sure the writing of the character that he played was that great in this film. It's a bat with sunglasses. It's funny, right? Paula Prentice, his wife, uh, and, a, and a great actress in her own right, and um, and she's good. She can do comedy. And she does have some good scenes in this movie. The movie, of course, is Saturday the 14th. Also starring Jeffrey Tambor, Arrested Development, tons of movies. If you're younger, SpongeBob movie, he was King Triton or Neptune. I can't remember if he was Neptune or Triton in that one. Uh, Severn Darden, you may not know the name. But if you're my age, you've probably seen him in something. I remember him best at first from um, uh, The Monkees. And uh, it's like a founder of Second City, uh, a lot of improv stuff, influential in comedy circles, and he can be very funny. And he has a couple good scenes in this movie. Carrie Michelson, um, what I know her from is Give Me a Break. She did a bunch of TV at the time, a couple movies. She's actually not bad in this movie. Kevin Brando, uh, he will play uh, the little boy, and he's he doesn't do too bad, really. Rosemary DeCamp will go through a few more of the credits. The music does not help this film. One of the problems with this movie is low energy, and the music does not really help in that regard, and it could. Director of Photography... Daniel Lacombre. Um, That's probably not how you pronounce that name. I apologize. Does some actual nice work in this movie. The shots are set up well and the lighting is really good. I like it. Uh, Co-produced by Jeff Began. And he also had the idea for the story. The screenplay was then written by Howard R. Cohen. And uh, movies produced by Julie Corman, daughter of Roger Corman. So it is a very Corman-esque sort of production. Maybe also a problem with the film. Directed by Howard R. Cohen. Sounds like he was a really nice guy. He primarily was a writer. This is the first movie that he directed. Doesn't have a lot of experience with comedy. And I think that's probably the through point to the problems with this movie. Um, But this kind of cracked me up. I'm looking at his credits writing. And he did a lot of work. For Roger Corman. And he wrote The Young Nurses, um, Vampire Hookers, which I think is an art film. Um, he wrote Death Stalker and had a lot of to do with the Death Stalker movies and Barbarian Queen. So if you're into 80s Barbarian flicks, this is your dude. Then he also wrote for Rainbow Bright and the Care Bears. Vampire Hookers, Rainbow Bright. It's showbiz, baby. So we start the film with this house. And I'll talk about this in a moment. This is probably a mistake. 
<laughs> right from the get-go in this film, at least for selling a joke later on. We start with the spooky old house. I love old dark house movies, whether they're horror, mystery, comedy. I love them, and I love spoofs. This movie should be right up my alley, which is why I think I can feel pretty confident in saying that it's not that good a movie, as opposed to, well, it's just not my style of comedy. It is my style of comedy. We see this license plate, Transylvania, 1981, and we meet our vampires, Jeffrey Tambor and um, Nancy Lee Andrews playing Yolanda. So, Waldemar and Yolanda are vampires. They are interested in getting this house. Why do they want this house? They have to wait till the morning. Realtor, kind of a weird lady. You have to fix her upper. Um, apparently, daylight not a problem for these vampires. That's going to be an issue later. Um, that's going to be an issue later. But So they're questioning her about the house, trying to act normal, but she doesn't seem like she's reacting to them like they're not normal. It just doesn't really work. And we'll get to later why they probably should have done this differently. It is a chance to meet them. They want to buy the house, though. She says, well, the owner just died, and then he's left it to a different person in his will. And then we go to the reading of the will. And here's our two main characters, John and Mary Hyatt, played by Richard Benjamin and Paula Prentice. And they're here for the reading of the will. Now, you see the gray-haired lady behind them, played by uh, Rosemary DeCamp, is Aunt Lucille, who expects she's going to be getting the inheritance of the estate of her brother. But in fact, what he leaves her are um, 300 overdue library books because she never returned anything either. Okay. And one more thing, a raspberry. Look, funny when Archie Bunker did it. Doesn't work as well here. So Lucille is rather annoyed by all of this and finds out that John and Mary have inherited the estate in Erie, Pennsylvania. Mary, we're going to own our own house finally. Now, that's a comedy point that probably should have been pushed a little bit harder in understanding why they stick around this house. But let's take a break here for a moment and talk about one of the issues with this movie and why it doesn't work as a comedy. A comedy needs to have a sort of theme and sort of ground rules that you work off of. This movie's all over the place all the time. It's kind of like, these are funny scenes from different movies. Let's kind of mash them all together. And then if you have a lot of funny, then the whole movie will be funny. And it doesn't work that way. And it, they never really establish what they quite want to do. It's kind of meant to be the spoof, the, the live action cartoon. But it has some stuff in there that really screws that up. We'll get to that later on in the movie. But what they find out is the house has a curse. And it's saying that the attorney, Stacy Teach Sr., grabs his throat and keels over dead. Okay. They don't really react to this. Why? Well, if it's a living cartoon, that's why. Because it's a cartoon and it's all funny when people like keel over dead because it's not real. Um, or is it because they're so desperate to own a house that they're willing to take a house that has an evil curse on it. I don't know. You're not going to know either. Here's the scene I was kind of talking about referencing. Atlas Van Lines moves up. Family gets out. Oh, look at this beautiful house that we have inherited. Oh, it's wonderful. Dad goes, yeah, it is. That's not the house. It's the one right behind us. Oh. Okay, let's back up for a minute, though. First of all, we've already seen the house. We know what it looks like. Okay? And we're seeing the house right here. This is how the set, the, 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 the scene is set up with this house. But the family then is looking at a completely different house. Now, you want to do this right. First of all, the vampires meet with the realtor in her office. We don't see the house yet. We don't know what they've inherited. Okay? We have no idea what they've inherited. But when they look and they see this, we go, wow, that's a really nice house. It's supposedly cursed, but gee whiz, that's that's gorgeous. And that's when dad goes, oh no, that's not the house. 
This is the house. And so then we see the horrible looking house. The comedy is not well structured. And again, I put that down to a director who primarily didn't work in comedy and in fact had never directed a comedy. So he doesn't quite get it. The vampires are there. They still want to buy the house. The realtor's like, well, I'm sure once they see this thing, they're not going to stay very long. They go in. It's all cobwebby. It's old. Doesn't look like it's been cleaned in 100 years. Weird little scene with the dog. Doesn't want to go in the house. And get used to this face because Richard Benjamin's going to make it about 400 times in this movie. This would be a good moment if he's sort of a observer of all the weirdness of him maybe breaking the fourth wall and looking at us like, wow, what is going on here? He's just always sort of confused and bemused by things and often doesn't notice anything amiss. Daughter goes looking around the house. We get the eyes looking through the painting gag. Okay, good. That's solid, old-fashioned, scary old house stuff. But the point of it is, it's just set up. Who's behind the painting? Is it the person who's going to be causing all the problems? You will never find out because you're never going to see that painting or those eyes. Again, there are potential candidates for who it could be, but none of them really seem to work out. Daughter's scared. Parents come to comfort her. I did like the painting rolling its eyes. That's funny. But see, the house is under a curse, but... Well, you're going to find out later. The The real horror has to be unleashed, and it hasn't been unleashed yet. So what's going on here? Vampires waiting outside. Again, they're going to spend most of this movie waiting outside. You get like this weird storm. So Dad should, again, he's going to go, oh, huh, that's weird, and then move on. Kids are watching TV. Every channel is Twilight Zone. Why, Dad? Well, it's a very popular show. Okay, so is he like the guy who doesn't see anything happening around him, and that's the comedy? Not really. Dad looking in the refrigerator while Mom cleans the kitchen. She finds a skull with dried blood on it, and she's sort of wiping it with her sponge, and then puts it back, and then wipes it again. Okay. A bit like that works if mom is cleaning and doesn't notice the skull. And then you have to keep doing that a lot in the movie, right? They're, they're oblivious. They don't know what's going on. How do you not react to this in some weird way? At a minimum, like, oh, whoa, right? Either they need to be aware there's something screwed up in the house, or they need to be blissfully unaware. But this thing straddles it. Dad finds a note in the refrigerator from his uncle, telling them about a book, an evil book. Don't look in the book. Don't touch the book. Don't open the book. He's like, what book? There's no book here. I don't know what he's talking about. You'd think maybe he'd say, wait, there were a bunch of books on the shelf. Maybe I should find out. No. Dad just goes on merrily with his life. No idea what's going on. No idea why he's doing anything. Let's put the spoilers up just in case anybody wants to watch this film. Well, Billy has found the book, and Billy has opened the book, and it is the book of evil. Whoa. This doesn't seem to impress him too much. It gets bad on Friday the 13th, but it gets worse on Saturday the 14th. Boy, this could have been the tagline of the picture because it ain't wrong. And so he's looking through the book, and he sees this picture of a monster. And then the monster picture glows, and the monster appears looking through a window behind him. Okay. And then he looks at a mummy. And there's a mummy. And then we cut to mom and dad kissing in the kitchen, and a weird rat-looking thing eating food in the kitchen. And now we're back to Billy. So the next problem with this film, weird cuts in the middle of scenes. They don't let a scene develop. Scenes need to have sort of a beginning, middle, end. Let them develop. If you're cutting between scenes, there needs to be a good reason for it. Often no reason here, and all it does is it busts up the joke. It's like telling somebody a joke, and in the middle of it, you mention that you have to pick up some potatoes for dinner tonight, and then, oh, back to my joke. It just doesn't work. Next monster appears. Okay. 
Realtor shows up. Maybe they're ready to sell the house by now. Again, there's storminess and something appears and she's like, no, 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 no. And then we see her purse hit the ground with blood on it. All right. If you're going to do gore in a comedy, a horror comedy, even, it needs to be excessive to the point of being cartoony. If you're just going to do a movie with a focus on horror, you can put a few jokes in. Evil Dead 2, Bruce Campbell. But you got to commit to horror. This does not commit. And it doesn't really offer up the tone and style that you're supposed to be expecting for the movie, which is what helps you sell your jokes and craft your jokes. So what's happened to the realtor? Who knows? We'll find out later, kind of. Husband and wife in bed. They hear weird noises. Maybe it's owls. Wife looks out and sees a bat. This is probably Waldemar the, the vampire. I say probably because they don't make it obvious. And lines later on would make you think maybe it wasn't him, but it's got to be him. But wife goes, yeah, it was owls. Okay, oblivious to a skull, fine. Doesn't know a bat from an owl? Is this woman an idiot or something? I don't know. It doesn't really work. Billy's in bed. And he's suddenly awoken by a monster in his room. Dad runs in. What's wrong, Billy? There's a monster. There's a monster. Oh, there's no monsters. Now don't be silly, Billy. <laughs> monsters behind him. Kid could be saying, Dad, turn around. I, I don't know. Monster sort of does a little thing behind him. And dad goes back to bed. And wife is not there. He finally notices that. Dad's not that observant. Goes looking for her. Here she is. She's got some puncture holes on her neck. Okay, that's why the bat probably is Waldemar. He snuck into the house, and he's um, he's bitter on the neck. If he needs to get in the house to do something, he already has gotten into the house. Why isn't he doing it? <laughs> It'll make this obvious. Who knows? Billy, meanwhile, discovers that the book can ward away the monsters. And he starts walloping on this monster with it. There's all these sparks. And then the monster goes out the window, crashes through it, lands below husband, wife, John and Mary. Boy, these noisy owls around here. Again with the owls. This is not the comedy that you think it is. Um, monster, I guess, dead. And that's the last we'll see of that monster. And now Waldemar goes, <gasps> they've discovered the book. Weren't you just in the house a minute ago? Or were you in the house a minute ago? Damned if I know. Damned if they know either. The morning, breakfast, Fruit Loops, my favorite cereal when I was a kid. Um, monster looks through the window. The flowers wilt. And there's this weird line where Mary puts water on the dead flowers. And John says, well, now they don't look quite as dead. What? I don't know. Just, they can't figure out what kind of comedy they're trying to do here. Daughter shows up. They're all trying to figure out who washed the dishes last night. And you notice the kitchen she was cleaning last night doesn't look like this kitchen. I guess she cleaned it, but who did the dishes last night? Well, if you did all that, why wouldn't you have just done the dishes? I don't know. And daughter finds this giant rubber glove. So I guess a monster did the dishes. Back to watching TV. Billy looking for a book that can end the evil that he's unleashed on the world. Mom and dad are going to go to the store and get some curtains. And also, hey, this window's broken. I need to get a new window. That's weird. <laughs> they go outside. Mom reacts to the sunlight. Because now she's a vampire. Is she a vampire? Uh, maybe she's a vampire. Damned if I know. They got their own vampire rules here. All right. Now we get to this scene where daughter Debbie is going to take a bath, um, which sort of is a spoof on slasher movies and the girl, you know, getting undressed and kind of a spoof on Creature from the Black Lagoon. She turns her back and there's this fin in the water, Jaws reference. They do it over and over and over again. As she keeps starting to get in the bath, but then, wait, I have to do this for... 
Now, there's comedy you could have done there with the monster, like getting impatient. Like, are you going to get in the tub or not? They don't really do that. It's just the stupid Finn. She finally gets in and she suddenly something happens. And, oh, it's a it's a rubber duck. It's fine. It's not a problem. Goes back to her relaxing bath. And then the monster rises up out of the bathtub. So we are in cartoon territory. He comes up out of the thing. She's shocked. He's growling at her, and we get the translation. Excuse me, miss. Have you seen anything of a large old book? Screams, runs downstairs. Billy, do something. What do you want me to do? Billy realizes, oh, the book. I need to get the book. Monster's coming down the stairs. He says, you keep them busy. I'll go get, I don't know if he says the book, but I'll go get something. He runs upstairs, can't find the book. What happened to the book? Mom cleaned his room. Mom must have done something with the book. Mom's a vampire. Ooh. Debbie's getting chased around by this monster in her towel. She trips. She falls. Monster is getting close. Police officer outside hears it. He's like a next door neighbor. Rushes in. Holds the gun on the monster. You better freeze, buddy. And monster's not freezing. I said you better freeze. You really better freeze. Meanwhile, Debbie's like, you know, screaming. <laughs> a little too intense for a comedy. Um, he shoots the monster in the head. It doesn't kill him. Monster then savagely murders the police officer. What? Huh? And drags his corpse outside. Okay, again. Are we going full bore horror with a little comedy, or are we a comedy... That's sort of spoofing horror. It's a little much the way they do it. And I think you have a director with more experience with horror movies. Doesn't know how to necessarily, he knows how to shoot the scene horror, but not necessarily comedy. Debbie passes out. Now, Billy's like, oh, crap. I've got to hide from everybody that I've unleashed all this evil on the world. Except mom and dad don't seem to notice anything. Or is mom working for the other side? A lot of stuff that's unclear in this movie. But apparently he drags her upstairs and puts her bath back in the tub. I guess with the hopes that she's going to think it was all a dream. And he goes back to reading a book. Mom and dad get home. Mom has sunglasses on now. So maybe they were going for mom as gradually turning into a vampire. That could be what the attitude was. Anything happened? No, everything's fine. We have this weird scene with him trying to take another book off the shelf and it's growling and he can't do it. Mom talking to Debbie. I had this weird dream. This monster chased me through the house. And blah, 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 blah. And Billy's like, oh boy, I'm in trouble here. It is now Friday the 13th. And dad is making a sandwich. Now, again, they're having this talk about, you know, what, what if you unleash an evil that could destroy the entire world? And dad's sort of oblivious to the conversation, but he's making this sandwich and he just keeps adding stuff. And Okay, sight gag, you need to have a really giant sandwich by the time that he's done. And it, it needs to be then firmly established. Dad is in space. He doesn't know what's going on ever. They don't really do that. They don't commit to a gag like they really need to in this film as they have this odd conversation. And we see, um, I think Debbie was looking at like, Wolfbane. I wonder why mom bought Wolfbane. And you notice it's Talbot brand, so it's a little Wolfbane reference. Mom is busy cleaning. Although it seems like the entire house has been cleaned. Mom's busy cleaning. She hears noises in the attic and goes upstairs and finds this cat, which struggles and runs away from her. And the cat's shown up before. Is the cat important to the story? Not really. Again, set up payoff. And you get setups and you get no payoff for them. She goes in to find the cat and discovers the place is full of bats, which she again mistakes for owls. And the bats attack her. And it is kind of a traumatic scene. There's blood. I mean, this is like, this is bad. And she kind of survives it and sees Waldemar there. Okay, Waldemar's in the house. Right? Why isn't Waldemar doing anything that he needs to do in the house? Wasting time with this. I don't know. I don't think anybody knows. 
He says, don't worry, the bats will never attack you again. Okay. Now, there should be a scene in here where mom lets dad know that she's been attacked by these bats savagely in the attic. Instead, it just cuts right to him, like looking for an exterminator in the phone book and noticing something took a big bite out of my sandwich. That's weird. Calls this dude up, an exterminator. I've got bats in my belfry. I'm an exterminator. Okay. You need to add, I'm an exterminator, buddy. You need a psychiatrist. No, you idiot. I got actual bats in my actual belfry. I need an exterminator. Well, there's an exterminator on hand, and the exterminator is Van Helsing, played by Darden. Um, the jokes don't quite land, but we kind of learned that he's been hanging around trying to find this book. He knows it's in some house, but he doesn't know where. Maybe this will be the one. And he shows up. I'm the exterminator. You don't look like an exterminator. Okay, don't tell me my business, buddy. Now, Darden's actually pretty funny, and he has decent timing, but they don't give him a lot of material to work with here. He informs them he will be staying overnight because you can't get rid of bats in just, you know, a few hours. Takes a while, notices all the books, thinks this might be the place. Here's an actual genuinely funny scene. He's going up the stairs to his room. Mom, turning into a vampire, shows up at the top of the stairs. The guy says, you know, when I am done... You won't have to worry about evil in this house. And mom starts screaming hysterically, running around in circles and then runs up the stairs. And he goes, that must be your lovely wife. It's actually pretty funny and the timing's good on it. So, hey, there's at least a little good stuff in this movie. Oh, here we're going to get dark again. And again, there's dark comedies, but you got to commit to being a dark comedy. And this movie doesn't quite commit. And I think, again, you have horror people doing it. So they're maybe, they're going for horror and they don't know how to make it necessarily that funny. But she's she's going to cook a roast. She opens up the thing. Hey, it's the cop's severed head with lots of blood. It's a great prop, but what? Brother walks in, little Billy, and the window has soon all dead. And he's hiding it because, remember, he's trying to hide all this stuff from these people who barely notice anything and neither of them would notice the head at first they're talking about this that and the other and then she notices the head goes running out again weird cut mom is in bed diaphanous gown holes on the neck very much like dracula hubby you know oh you're probably just tired maybe you're pregnant girl screaming dad runs out to comfort her and they go in and there's actually a roast and it's been cooked, which by itself should be weird because it wasn't cooked a minute ago. But, okay, the cop's severed head is now gone. We get a dinner scene. Again, Paula Prentice is pretty good in this scene. She doesn't want to eat anything. She hates garlic. Nobody's figuring out, well, I may be pregnant. And here we get a line. They knew where they wanted to go, but they didn't know how to get there. And they probably shouldn't have even tried. Because Van Helsing remarks, out of nowhere, do we know who the father is? Because you remember, Rosemary had a baby. So they want a Rosemary baby reference. It is just out of left field, and it doesn't really work. And all Dad says is, I don't like that kind of talk. God help me. What is happening here? And... Um, so he starts talking about how he's explaining to them the, the curse of the house and the book has been opened and evil has been unleashed and it's going to destroy the world. And you see Billy is like, oh man, <laughs> I really screwed up. And you know, I don't know what I'm going to do about this. And suddenly dad wakes up. Well, if this house is cursed, we're going to sell it. Let's talk to that realtor. Dude. Beginning of the movie, you were told the house was cursed by a man who then clutched his throat and collapsed dead. You knew the thing was cursed. Did you just not believe? Oh, boy. Yeah. You go, can't do it. We have to stop it. Tomorrow is Saturday the 14th. We have to stop the evil then. 
Well, we're going to have a party tomorrow night. Oh, that's good. Extra people, positive energy. So let's have the party. That night. And here, actually, another funny scene. Waldemar is talking in mom's head. She gets out of bed and she's you know, wandering through the halls. And he said, you must get the book. You must bring me the book. Well, of course, she's a vampire now. She's a monster. And when she touches it, it sparks and she can't grab the book. And, and Tambor is perfect for this line. He's like, okay, he might as well go back to bed. I'll try to think of something else. It, it, it's funny. It works. It's another decent scene. Uh, we get Van Helsing reading from this book. The vampires are out there. We've got to get in there. Van Helsing's in the house. He's beaten us to it. We've got to get in there. And you get a little bit about, are you sure you're not a little too into that woman? And he's like, honey, we've been married for 311 years. I would think you could trust me. Again, it's a good line for Tambor. Um, he becomes a, va- a bat. She becomes a bat. And they fly, apparently, into the house. Now, weird cut to this scene. Debbie gets up to go use the restroom. She walks in. There's a weird light. And she realizes she's in the kitchen. And the monsters are in the kitchen. And one of them is cleaning. And the other ones are making a mess. How do I get out of here? She kind of just sneaks by them. And then as she goes up the stairs, there's all this fog. And the bathtub monster's after her, but he can't find her in the fog. And he's stumbling around a little bit. And she goes to bed. It just doesn't work. And there's almost no point to it. They, the vampires, get into the attic. She's still giving them crap about that Nina Harker chick in London. Honey, it was a hundred years ago. Van Helsing is playing with chemistry set. Vampires come down to confront him. We found the house first. I got into the house first. And they're going to attack him. And he's like, ah, you know what this will do to you. And then oh, they recoil. and They run away, turn into bats and fly away. He goes, I can't believe they fell for that. Is this a setup? No, it is not a setup. It just... And they almost explain the jokes as they tell them. Next day, Billy, I got to get out of this house. Van Helsing, you can't leave this house. And he's right. There's this weird storm outside whenever Billy tries to leave. Yikes. What am I going to do? Well, it's Saturday the 14th. So all hell's going to break loose today. Would you like some coffee? Notice the Count Chocula. Like it? I don't like it. I never liked chocolate cereals as a kid. My wife loved them. It didn't work for me. Even as a kid, chocolate for breakfast just fell wrong. It was, a, it was a step too far. He doesn't want the coffee. He hands it to Dad. And there's eyeballs floating in the coffee. Dad sees the eyeballs and does his sort of a, hmm, that's weird, and puts a napkin over it. Okay, he knows the house is cursed. Horror. I, uh, and then we're going to get this line, Billy, take this coffee away. I can't stand the sight of it. The refrigerator has been trashed by the monsters. Notice the Coca-Cola product placement. Daughter shows up. We're talking about the party, etc. And um, it's, un- it's, again, it's another kind of wasted scene. It doesn't really go anywhere. He goes upstairs to talk to his wife, who's still in bed in the daytime, and notices she's sleeping <laughs> on dirt and... Um, obviously it's because she's a vampire and she's turning into a vampire and she <laughs> says, oh, I must have spilled a, a flower pot. <laughs> and he's again, oh, that's weird. <laughs> it's just, but now she's kind of like, you know, she makes a grab for the jugular. He hears the doorbell. And so he's like leaves and she kind of falls out of bed. And it, again, Princess did a pretty good job here. I really do give her credit for this. Um, there were some good moments. Who's at the door? This is another funny line. I enjoyed this one. Uh, Van Helsing opens the door. A guy says, liquor store. And Van Helsing goes, no, private residence, and closes it. And the guy knocks again. You notice, again, the Doritos product placement. Got to have the product placement. Although Coke and Doritos might not have been happy after they saw the movie. 
Billy wants to make a run for it again. He can't. Dad notices this again. So dad should be getting really clued into the evil of the house. And he kind of seems like he is and kind of seems like he isn't. He's still kind of oblivious to stuff. The delivery boy tries to leave. He can't either. Looks like he's going to stay for the party. Everybody's now dressed up and waiting for party time. There's kind of a nice little scene where Debbie's freaked out and she looks over at the delivery guy and he kind of smiles at her and she's like, and he's like kind of depressed. And I, I kind of like, I kind of genuinely like the, the delivery boy. Dad keeps saying, who is he? You were there when he got there. What are you talking about? Van Helsing is setting up all sorts of doodads to help fight the evil. Doorbell rings. Mom rushes down. It's nighttime, so she's active, and she's got her little thing choker on, so you can't see the neck. And it's the relatives, and they're all obnoxious, and there's nothing really that funny comes out of this. He's like, okay, we got, hey, you know, can you go tin bar? And he's like, what are you talking about bar? We need to, you know, fight the evil. So here's another place where the editing or the, the script order doesn't really lend itself that well to what they're doing. Aunt Lucille goes off on her own to hang up her fur coat, opens a closet, and sees a fur coat just like it, and she's annoyed that that um, that Mary bought a coat just like hers, and the coat attacks her. Okay, so we're picking off people one by one. This is the first incident of it. Nobody's going to notice that she's really gone for a while. You'll see why it probably is an issue. Next door neighbor shows up. Hi, I live next door. My husband's the police officer. I haven't seen him for two days. I guess he's working overtime. Well, you know, the economy. And in the background, you see the coat with apparently Lucille underneath it walking away, or maybe it swallowed her, and we'll never see that again. So the neighbor's pretty clueless, uh, but everybody's pretty clueless, and so who gives a crap? Um, Van Helsing is making cocktails. This weird... It's a bowl of ice. It has cobwebs on it. And he goes, should we use this ice? It's just so old. Get it? Because ice doesn't really get old. I don't know, man. They're in there swinging. It just doesn't work. Um, Van Helsing kind of announces we we need to fight the evil. There's the evil. we got to fight the evil. What? There's the evil. Where's the boy? We need the boy. We need the book. we got to find the boy. So now we split up to find the boy. Could have saved the Lucille bit for this. And again, they're going to cut between scenes in a way that doesn't work. Think about the scene, uh, the bit in Clue, where they split up to search, and you're getting a little snippet of each as it escalates. More competently directed, you could have done that here, but it, the scenes kind of intrude on each other. So she's looking up in the attic, the boy kind of following her around, puppy love. Mom puts on an oven mitt to go find the book. She knows where the book is, but it's not there. Ooh, she is kind of working for the other side, I guess. Dad, anybody in here? And there's a monster on the other side of the door who shakes his head no really silently. Dad leaves, door kind of pops back open. Dad's still oblivious. Okay, this is a weird scene, and it doesn't work well, but it also gets interrupted. Neighbor, looking in the kitchen... Her husband's severed head is behind her. She doesn't notice. At least not at first. Van Helsing, 667. Cousin Rhonda, looking in a room, finds the spooky realtor. It's a fixer-upper. Um, leaves, monster follows her. Back to the kitchen, where a monster is attacking her. And she sees her husband's head. Does this horrify her? No, she's saying... Why aren't you doing anything to help me? She doesn't know it's a severed head? Back to Cousin Rhonda. Killed by the monster. We have now eliminated these people with virtually no comedy and virtually no point to it. The family, plus delivery boy, is freaked out. There's Van Helsing. The lighting suddenly changes and who appears but our vampires... With Billy, who's wearing a little vampire cape? Is Billy a vampire? No, I don't know why he's wearing a cape. But he's got the book. And then the monsters all show up. And it 
turns out the monsters are working with Van Helsing. So Van Helsing is the bad guy? Does that mean the vampires are the good guys? Maybe? Don't really know. Um, give me the book. No, I'm not giving you the book. I know the truth about you. Give me the book, boy. The vampires levitate Billy. Apparently this keeps Van Helsing from getting him. He's like maybe two feet off the ground. And they're going to have this magic battle over the levitation. As the monsters continue to get closer. Nice shot. I love the way they filmed this scene. I love the way they lighted this scene. It is, it is good. And you get a bit you would see in Looney Tunes. The making of faces back and forth. And um, we got our vampire here. He's ah, But there's like a weird foghorn noise behind it. And he's doing a face and there's weird noises for him too. It doesn't really work. Break. Lightning. Magic. What's going on? Back to faces. No, get all the faces done at once and then do the little magical back and forth. Again, just weird editing. Not not good. It, it What little jokes you have, it breaks them up. Hissing, etc. Monsters getting closer. Bathtub monster shows up again and takes a swipe at Debbie. Oh my goodness. Dad looks happy there, I think, because uh, Richard Benjamin's like, damn, this movie's almost over. I hope this won't kill my career. Uh, it didn't, thankfully. Um, Billy's like, hey, the books worked before on killing monsters. Maybe it'll work this time, too. And Helsing gets a hold of the book. And the book glows red. And then Van Helsing glows red. And then poof. And you hear his little, no, no. It's kind of funny. So the book destroys Van Helsing. And Billy's happy. And the vampires are happy. And the family is confused, as are we all. Wait, what just happened here? They didn't establish good rules for how all this is supposed to work and what it's supposed to do so that we could have a twist. It's just sort of like, I don't know. I, I Sometimes you think the writer knew in his head, but he didn't put it down on, on the paper in the script. And the vampires are like, yes, he wanted to rule the world with the monsters and the book and the monsters and something. But it's all over now. And now you can be a happy family again. They deserve happiness. Oh, they are a happy family. Oh, yeah, delivery boy left. Dog came back. And we see them now in the other house. Did the bad house turn into the good house? Did, I, did they buy the... I, I don't know. I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. I think I was almost more excited for this because I'm like, oh, yeah, I remember when that was at the end of movies. I haven't seen one of those in a long time. Okay. Let's take off the spoilers. Let's get into it. It just doesn't work. Um, you got to establish a certain kind of tone and sort of ground rules. They didn't do that. You need to have, if you're doing a spoof, you need to have a lot of jokes. They don't have enough jokes, so there's a lot of quiet stuff. Um, the jokes need to be better constructed. You need higher energy. This is a very low energy movie. The timing is just off, and I think a lot of that comes down to the director and screenwriter. So, you know, I'm sorry to say it, but Cohen, I think just this could have been a much better movie if you had somebody in there was a little more experienced with comedy um richard benjamin again directed money pit what if he had directed this movie it might have been a little bit better um oftentimes i'll say look if you love this movie as a kid and again kids seem to have liked this i remember kids talking about it it was big on video cassette it was big on like hbo if it's a nostalgic favorite of yours a lot of times i'll say hey watch it for the nostalgia you might want to let those memories stay pristine and let this one go. If, though, you are interested in comedy and you're learning comedy and you want to see a comedy that just doesn't work, so you can kind of learn what not to do, Saturday the 14th might be the right film for you. So what say you, my audience, am I off base here? Is this one of the great comedies? Is it a cult movie? Do you love it? Do you hate it? Leave it in the comments. I'd love to hear from you. 
and I'll get back to you as soon as I possibly can uh, if it's a comment where there's a question or something like that. If you enjoyed this video, please give a like, maybe think of subscribing, sharing with a friend. Until next time, though, God bless everybody. Please be kind to one another. Have a happy Saturday the 14th. Maybe throw on a really good horror comedy. I don't know. Ghostbusters or, well, whatever. And I will hopefully see you again soon in Dad's Den of Pop Culture. Bye-bye.